So good morning. Uh, thank you for hosting us here at Villanova University today. Um, as Sue said, at CRS, I manage a team of technology professionals who are responsible for designing technology solutions that are used in our field work. I want to cover five topics very briefly over the next 30 minutes. Uh, number one, I'll introduce the overall state of information and communication technology for relief and development. Next, we'll look at CRS as a case study. I'll share some of the lessons that we've learned as we try to introduce technology into our field work. I'll share some of what we're seeing is possible with technology today, and then conclude by describing how we are creating sustainable solutions at scale. The relief and development sector is witnessing a fundamental transformation as practitioners begin to mainstream the use of information and communication technology in their work, and as developing communities gain access to information and services that were never before within their reach. This emerging field of information and communication technology for development, which goes by the acronym ICT4D, has enormous potential to enhance the quality and effectiveness of our relief and development programs across the globe. We're seeing that mobile ICT solutions are being implemented in a variety of sectors, such as SMS messages to remind patients about antiretroviral therapies, mobile phone services to help farmers gain access to market prices, tools to rapidly assess the impact of programs on community well-being, distance learning courses, business planning tools to improve the skills of farmers, systems that can warn communities of impending disasters, and mobile money systems that extend banking services to rural communities, to name some of them. At the same time, access to mobile technology is becoming all but ubiquitous. The International Telecommunications Union predicts that mobile cellular penetration this year will reach 96% of the population globally, 89% in developing countries, and 63% in Africa. Internet usage is also growing. The ITU also estimates that 31% of the people in the developing world have access to the internet today. The real value of the technology is that it ends the isolation of poor communities and provides them access to digital information and services that are already beginning to change their lives. Poor communities now have access to, to and opportunities to engage in markets. They have direct access to health information, education information, financial and advisory services. They have a voice that can be heard across the world. Actors in the relief and development sector, from donors to non-governmental organizations, to universities, to private sector companies and governments, all have a role to play in helping the poor to seize these opportunities with, that the new technologies can enable. Let me share a video that we use. Each year we host a uh, conference where we bring together practitioners in the ICT4D community um, I'm going to share a video that we used at our most recent conference, which was held this past March in Nairobi. Is it that audible in the back? Louder? farming when they are trained, it is completely different from those who are not trained. Before the training, my farming methods were poor, but after the training, I've been able to grow better crops and get my produce to market. Simply, I'm no longer a farmer, but I'm a strong, determined businessman. ICT4D empowers community members to improve their livelihoods. Here in Kenya, we use distance learning to train extension agents, who in turn are going to train small scale farmers in sustainable crop production. The ultimate goal of the program is for the extension agents to be able to facilitate all small scale farmers to develop business plans. CRS is the one that provides us with the technology. It's actually our extension offices who can be able to uh, 
roll it out into the field, into the countryside, because we have the numbers and we have the network. And this technology helps us to understand how we can be able to serve each and every of those uh, communities based on their needs. It is key to linking uh, the producers and the buyers of the agricultural produce. The farming communities are learning how to diversify their incomes and how to manage their resources better. This will make them more resilient to changes of modern life. It's important that farmers are resilient so that they can build back after a disaster calamity. ICT for d is important when you are working in development setup, for example here in Kenya, as well as when you are working in emergency setup uh, like in the Philippines. Immediately after the typhoon, there was a lot of confusion. There were people walking around looking for loved ones. They were trying to find resources, water, food. Now that we've moved from the emergency phase to the recovery phase, technology has been very helpful in keeping track of the beneficiaries we reach. Coastal areas are mostly coconut areas. So we're focusing on the coconut farmers or those households dependent on coconut farming. Because coconut is a long gestating crop, they can't have income until they have their new trees. We're trying to help them meet their household requirements in terms of food. So introducing vegetable gardens, backyard gardens, while they're waiting for assistance to recover from the typhoon. When we go to register them, we collect data about their needs and the damage that they suffered at the household level. Using devices like this can of course help us in helping beneficiaries because if we are able to get information or data from the field faster and more accurate, then we can have the information available for our use as soon as possible. It allows us to be more accountable to beneficiaries, to donors, to other organizations, and to provide data to individuals in other offices as well as throughout the world. We use technology to innovate. We use technology to rebuild. We use technology to promote business. In our ICT programming, we use technology to restore hope. So in 2009, when CRS first embarked on a formal program to integrate the use of technology in our field projects, our use of ICT in the field at that point was really quite modest. Our largest undertaking at that point was deployment of a series of netbooks or small laptops to about 250 agriculture workers in East Africa to uh, help with the eradication of cassava disease. From that project, uh, we learned a lot. We learned things that worked, that didn't work, and a lot of that has really influenced uh, where we've taken our ICT 4D work over the subsequent years. So going back to 2009, we first established a business case for investing in the use of ICT. Technology is not cheap. The people, the devices, the software, all has a cost. We built a portfolio of information describing the technology solutions in use in our field operations and the business problems to which they were being applied. We launched an ICT 4D service desk to support project managers in adapting those solutions to their own needs 
we created an innovation fund so that we could jumpstart efforts that we thought had the most promise. So that would create the space for experimentation and figure out what direction we wanted to, to take this initiative. In 2010, we began holding the conferences, such as the one that the video was produced for this year, in locations around the world to raise the awareness to our staff, to our partners, our peers, our donors, about the impact of ICT4D solutions that can have on the quality of the relief and development work that we're conducting. We've come to understand the value that cross-sector partnerships bring to ICT4D. And I'll speak to this a little bit more in a couple of slides. We also began grappling with the business models that would be needed to sustain the results of these efforts. Today, we have experience using ICT4D in every geography that we work in and every sector that we work in. Our agency has recognized ICT4D as a core competency that we need to evolve to meet our agency goals. Last year, we put forth a new five-year strategy. Our organization aspires to reach 150 of the most poor and vulnerable people around the world and to increase to more than to 10 million the number of Catholics that we inspire and engage to take action in solidarity with the poor. The language that's depicted here around our strategy speaks to both the quantity, the number, and the quality of our work, continuously improving our programs. We prioritize three signature program areas, emergency response, agriculture livelihoods, and health. In these areas, our objective is to establish a recognized position of sector leadership and influence by demonstrating technical and operational excellence and the ability to go to scale with outcomes that are evidence-based. Success in these signature program areas significantly contribute to achieving our aspirations to increase the number of people that we serve and the quality of our programs. There are core competencies that we feel will enable us to meet these objectives. To excel in these signature program areas, we have identified five of these competencies for deeper cultivation and strategic investments. We have seen how ICT4D can influence the quality and effectiveness of our programs, and this is now firmly embedded in our agency strategy. So what have we learned along the way? Many of our projects first focused on ICT4D as a means to improve the efficiency, timeliness, and quality of reporting to donors. But it quickly became apparent that such solutions and the access to near real-time information that they provide to us can be used to enhance our project management and the efficacy of our projects by providing information that leads to better and more better informed decision making. We realized that by putting technology in the hands of the agriculture field agents, community health workers, we were helping them to acquire new life skills and we were strengthening the institutions that employ them. We also realized that we were able to reach more people by introducing tools that bridge geographic divides. No longer did workers need to travel long distances to file their reports, to participate in training programs, to gain access to expert advice or training. Most exciting of all, we learned that these new opportunities can empower community members by providing them with direct access to information digitally and digital services that can be used on their own to improve their own well-being. We began to understand that ICT4D solutions basically change the way people carry out their work and how they interact. As we learned this, we began to think about that change from several perspectives. Number one, we needed to understand the benefits in ICT4D solution was going to provide and look at those benefits through the eyes of each group of stakeholders. Second, we needed to understand how the solution would impact a stakeholder and their day-to-day -day practices. And finally, we needed to understand the context in which the solution would operate, the environmental constraints, whether it's connectivity or power, political constraints, such as government regulations, cultural constraints, such as language, gender, and education levels. Once the people, processes, and context was understood and defined, we found we could pick an ICT4D solution 
that was well suited to a project's goals. We began to value certain characteristics of solutions. First, cloud solutions that do not require investment in infrastructure other than end user devices, be they mobile phones, tablets, and so forth. Software services that can be easily configured by users and maintained without the need for large investments in IT staff. Solutions appropriate to the complexity of individual users' data needs. Solutions that work in environments with intermittent power and access to communication networks. And solutions that work across a range of end user devices. <coughs> we learned the importance of looking at the full life cycle of costs of a solution, not just the upfront costs of the devices, but those required to maintain and support the solution over time. We learned to compare the cost of working with and without the support of technology. And this was perhaps one of the pieces that was most informative to grow our use of ICT4D, to do those cost comparisons and look at where we were gaining efficiencies and saving money using technology versus not using technology. And then finally, we learned the importance of thinking about our strategy for deploying and supporting an ICT solution early in the phases of its design. We learned the importance of implementing a formal change management program to facilitate the people changes or the behavior changes needed to fully adopt ICT. We've had a number of great partnerships in carrying out our ICT enabled projects. If I were to point to one thing that has made these partnerships partnerships most successful, I would talk about shared value. Our partnerships and technology providers have allowed us to influence the direction that ICT products and services take to meet the needs of the communities we serve. This is true both with some very small software vendors we work with. You saw in the video a number of individuals using a mobile data collection tool that comes from a small vendor called Xerion Software. We've had a great deal of influence over that product. So very large vendors back in the uh, Cassava Initiative we had influence with Intel and uh, the chips that they were putting into particular netbooks and how they behaved that were um, advantageous to our needs. As a result of this and as a result of these partnerships, we're becoming more effective in our work and our partners are gaining an entrance into new markets. So what are some of the ICT solutions that are available today that offer key benefits to the poor? The vast majority of the millions of people living in poverty around the world are engaged in agriculture livelihoods, livelihoods that could benefit from ICT4D solutions designed to improve farm productivity, to link farmers to markets, and to enhance the government's ability to provide land management services. In the public health domain, each year, over 300,000 women die in childbirth, more than 7.5 million children are, stu are stillborn or die within four weeks of birth. Health challenges that benefit from the use of ICT4D solutions designed to increase demand for health services, to improve the ability of community health workers to deliver those services, and to strengthen national health services. After our break, we'll hear from Mariana, who led the deployment of innovative tools that enable community health workers, such as the one pictured here, to be more impactful. The use of ICT-4D in emergency response efforts improves our ability to coordinate relief efforts, to make informed decisions, and to manage the timely delivery of critical life resources. In this photo, we're showing a CRS staff member who's registering families of coconut farmers in San Juan Tacloban. The, uh, these farmers were uh, heavily affected by Typhoon Haiyan, which struck the Philippines uh, last November and resulted in over 6,000 deaths. The families are being registered for programs that provide alternative livelihoods in the aftermath of that storm. In the education sector, ICT4D provides uh, solutions and opportunities to improve school administration and offers both teachers and students access to a wealth of learning resources and educational programs. In peace building, we're seeing the use of mobile technology to monitor elections and organize advocacy efforts. Truly, ICT4D solutions have emerged in all aspects of our relief and development work. So how do we create and sustain solutions that can be scaled? While opportunities to benefit from ICTs exist and have shown results, in many instances, their value has been demonstrated only on a small scale or for a relatively short duration. 
So how do we scale these across geography and across time? How do we ensure that ICT solutions continue to deliver benefits after the project ends or after the donor funding source comes to conclusion? We know it's possible. We've seen in PESA, for example, the mobile payment system in that, and uh, money transfer service that was launched by Safaricom in 2007 in Kenya. Uh, in December 2011, it had 19 million subscribers. It's created demand that the uh, Communications Commission of Kenya attributes to, in large part, to low-income earners who previously did not have access to financial services. Organizations such as the World Bank, the World Health Organization, the International Telecommunications Union, the M Health Alliance, and others have been studying the factors that facilitate the adoption of ICTs. First, without an enabling environment, like <clears throat> one that provides prerequisite for rapid adoption, ICT is not likely to have full economic, political, and social impact that we desire. An enabling environment accomplishes a number of factors. First, it requires a regulatory and political structures that encourage open competition, that incentivize investment in ICT, reduces the barriers to the flow of information, to the <coughs> reduces barriers to the flow of goods and to the flow of services, and embraces favorable ICT policies, including those that encourage universal access. Second is a business environment that encourages innovation and has access to skilled labor and venture capital. Third, an, affordo an affordable infrastructure one that takes advantage of the proliferation of mobile devices, the rapid growth of mobile broadband, the growing number of cloud services, and, the and that can function in that occasionally connected environment to provide services to the rural poor. Number four, the development of ICT skills within government, business, and individual communities. We should never underestimate the ability of those who have not had the advantages of high level of education to learn and quickly adopt new technologies. As an anecdote on this point, the team that, um, that I'm a part of that introduces the use of technology in our field work is spread throughout the globe. We have a team, um, several folks in, we have somebody in Madagascar, Burkina Faso, Kenya, uh, India, Haiti, and this team works together as one unit. They're in constant collaboration. They're literally traveling all over the world to introduce these technologies. Um, and we've seen very rapid adoption of technology by individuals with uh, low literacy or no literacy that uh, quickly embrace uh, and gain a sense of empowerment from the use of this technology. And the final point is uh, the need for strong leadership. The commitment and collaboration between the organizations that are engaged in ICT4D to create that environment. And then the other kind of major aspect to reaching sustainability is that ICT4D solutions need to be considered in relationship to the value chain in which their users participate. The most successful business value for delivering ICT services to the poor consider the impact of these services on all of the value chain players, the benefits that the players can derive from these services, their ability should they invest in such services, to achieve a favorable return on investment. A good example of this is the introduction of uh, validation mechanisms for, um, by pharmaceutical companies for verifying the authenticity of drugs, where there's, uh, you know, the value chain players involved include the pharmaceutical company that wants to avoid competition from counterfeits, the telecommunications provider that is delivering the SMS messaging, and obviously the consumer or the patient that is consuming that medication. Over the, the years that we've had experience using mobile technology for monitoring and evaluation, uh, we've introduced this technology throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and the Middle East. The um, one tool that I've referenced earlier, the Xerion software product, we've used in over 160 projects. We've had over uh, 2,500 users work with it and have uh, collected over 4.5 million records. Um, some of the other examples cited here kind of depict that timeline. The example I mentioned earlier around that first use of um, network computers to uh, help eradicate the cassava disease um, for seed fairs. So seed fairs are a way to distribute um, seeds to, to farmers uh, through their kind of voucher program and using technology to manage the registration process has yielded significant 
um, savings in labor costs. Um, the National Health, uh, Health Survey that was conducted around malaria, knowledge, attitudes, and practices in Sierra Leone, um, we had very timely data, very uh, much more accurate results. And then real-time assessments following cyclones in Madagascar been, that aided in delivering the uh, right aid and the reconstruction uh, uh, materials to those communities in a more timely way. One example of where we're taking ICT4D to scale is an initiative that we call Evaluate. This is a multi-year effort to standardize and scale our use of ICT4D for monitoring and evaluation. It facilitates easier and more accurate data collection, better efficiency for our data collection and reporting, more transparency and accountability, better tools for decision making and service delivery, and easier performance tracking across projects, countries, and regions. Although only used on a small scale at CRS today, as I think about where our use of technology is heading, um, geographic information systems hold incredible potential. We're seeing a confluence of funding opportunities, organizational readiness, and technology that's emerging as an opportunity for geospatial analysis to have a powerful impact. In 2011, the USAID Office of Science and Technology made investments such as the Center for the Application of Geospatial Analysis for Development called the GeoCenter. Um, more recently, they launched a development lab at the College of William & Mary as part of their Higher Education Solutions Network. We're seeing ICT4D as enabling many of our field projects to collect a wealth of geocoded data. The next logical step is, in my mind is to apply geospatial analysis to this data to have a decisive impact upon the coordination of international humanitarian assistance. A robust geospatial analysis service will allow our programs to reach higher quality and impact through data informed decisions. We're seeing the use of, where we're seeing the use of GIS today um, primarily is for operational purposes to show what we're doing, where we're doing it, and use that to um, kind of as a way to communicate with various stakeholders, such as we're seeing in this example here showing the, um, you know, some damage and reconstruction efforts that took place in Madagascar after a cyclone, I think, two years ago. So in conclusion, the use of technology in relief and development is disruptive. It involves a major shift in the way we carry out our work. This change has been somewhat messy, but the rewards of making it are becoming more and more evident to the poor and vulnerable people, to their governments, their business communities, and the NGOs that serve them. Stepping up to this change takes courage, commitment, and drive. We are helping our organization adapt to this change and to form the kind of cross-sector partnerships that are necessary to ensure that the ICT4D solutions benefit the lives of the poor and the vulnerable, both today and in the future. Thank you. And I think we break? Uh, no, we'll have, we have time for questions. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So I'm happy to take questions. Yes? Steve, uh, wonderful. Uh, you decided to, in many of your projects to work with and through governments on many levels from the national all the way down. What are some of the challenges that you face in working with governments which might not uh, have the, uh, the training, the stability uh, when you have these long-term plans? It's on. So first and foremost, we work through local partners. And typically, um, they are often church partners. They're not always. They have a presence in the area that we're working. Um, we obviously can only work at the you know, where we're permitted to by the government. Um, there are governments that are more restrictive and that inhibit our work. And there are governments that are more um, helpful and help enable our work. There, yeah, there's a great deal of variability. Um, some countries there is extreme corruption. There are barriers that make um, not only our use of technology but our really development work at large um, diff more difficult. Yes. Um, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things you emphasized was uh, developing sustainable business models with this uh, technology. Could you expand on that a little bit, please? Yeah, the, um, that's, I would say that's admittedly our most <coughs> challenging aspect because the way that, as an NGO, the way that we work, things are project-based. And a project, by definition, has a defined start and a defined end. And what we, want, what we strive for is that where we're introducing a technology that has relevance beyond the length of that project, 
that it's done in a way that is uh, is sustainable. Um, the example that you're going to hear from uh, Mariana after the uh, break was done in partnership with the uh, government of Uttar Pradesh in India, where they were, I don't want to kind of steal too much of her presentation, but introducing a mobile technology to their the ashes, which are the community health workers, to provide uh, counseling to uh, pregnant women and to uh, mothers until shortly after childbirth to help reduce incidence of uh, uh, maternal death and uh, newborn uh, fatalities. And they did this through an incentive model that the community health workers who were given these devices, uh, they were part of their compensation was based on the number of women that um, delivered their children, uh, delivered the baby at a health facility versus at their home. So things like that, that there is a, um, I guess it's not an example of truly um, self-sustaining like a private business model. It, um, the ongoing duration of that project would be funded by the, um, that state government in India. Um, I was going to ask a similar question about uh, your partnerships with technology companies. How do you kind of go about um, making those partnerships and sustaining them and, and making it something that the technology companies would want to participate in? Could, could, could I just yes. on the yes. business desk if uh, the, um, if it's open source hardware software that you're working with? Yes. Um, so let me let me answer both questions. See, um, the partnerships have been through we uh, through trial and error to figure out uh, applications and devices that work well in the context that we're working in. And so, uh, going back five years, we had um, a much wider variety of software and devices that we were working with, and we consolidated that to say, you know, we have a now essentially a toolkit of repeatable um, pieces of software that we have built the organizational capacity around and the ability to support. And we've done that based on you know, what's worked well and where we have, as I mentioned, that shared value with the technology partners. Um, many of the um, many technology providers are extremely generous to us as a nonprofit and to the work that we're doing in the developing world and making their uh, software available at uh, either free or highly reduced prices. Um, and it's really been through um, the, where we've seen uh, companies are willing to adapt to the work that we're trying to do, but that's where we've um, kind of centered our, uh, our toolkit of services around. To the question around uh, open source versus commercial products, um, we have steered more towards commercial products. Um, uh, I was mentioning before to talk that my prior experience, I did a lot of work with open source technologies. Or the organization that we're in now, we found that to have a uh, company that provides very deep support and really, um, I'll use an example, in the GIS space, we work with Ezra, and they're, they're open source products that compete with the uh, ArcGIS suite. Um, they really provide significantly more to us in terms of professional services and uh, assistance than the very, the most token amount that we pay to use their software. And so it really, it makes a compelling case for us to get access to the very um, first class software with a deep support model. It seems like from what you were saying that a lot of the technology is still very much in the hands of the CRS employees. Um, is that is that a correct assumption? I mean, not typically. Um, because all the work that we're doing is carried out by partner organizations, it's much more that the devices, the, the netbooks, the mobile phones, the uh, tablets are in the hands of those organizations. Um, Sean's going to talk to us about a suite of tools called FarmBook, which is often used by agriculture extension workers. Um, not is the role of CRS is in helping to uh, set up the um, the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, to deliver training and in some cases to support their ongoing use, but not to be the ones that are typically out um, using the device on the ground. But the, so the device on the ground is people going into the field, but it's not necessarily the technology staying in these farming communities. It depends on the initiative. Like okay. there's, um, we have examples where we introduce um, SMS data collection mechanisms to provide early warning of rapid onset disasters. We saw this used in um, uh, in India for an area that's very prone to flooding. So that the service is in place to the community members using, in that case, using the phones that they already had. Sure. But now this is an information service that can help uh, kind of crowdsourcing information to um, to local government to provide that uh, warning. 
Um, similarly in Ethiopia, in where there's uh, kind of cyclical patterns, we've seen a very similar service introduced to gather that type of information <coughs> to be able to assess where where the next famine uh, is at risk, where the risk of the famine might be coming from. Um, having said that, more of our examples are in the use of uh, technology for a more of a finite purpose. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I'm Michelle Bistel on the last call. Um, this summer I was, I met with a few engineers in, at Harvard that are working on a project called Open Pediatrics Portal. I think it's a collaboration with IBM, but they're basically creating an online platform to train, um, to use doctors in the United States to train um, healthcare workers abroad. And I just wanted to know if like, that's part of what you guys are thinking, to try to use technology to train from the United States to people around the world. Yeah, I mean, a big part of our health programming is what we call health system strengthening, which is exactly that, helping to provide um, uh, health facilities or consortiums of health facilities the information and the skills necessary to provide better services. So that I'm not familiar with that particular um, service, but it's exactly in line with some of the work that we're doing. I can put you in touch with the people who I met with. Yeah, definitely, definitely welcome that. You mentioned really briefly about uh, uh, contacting about 10 million of the Catholics here in the United States. How does it, is that just through um, just advertising and marketing? Um, no, it's, um, and I'm glad we have uh, Lou here from our organization that uh, that helps helps in that area. And probably, do you want to field that question? You can probably speak to that better than I can in the terms of US ops and how that uh, advocacy works. Sure. Uh, my name is Lou Charest with CRS, and I'm in our U.S. Operations Division, which was formed about 10 years ago. And it was to engage Catholics and Catholic institutions and th those that support our mission and connect them more directly with our efforts overseas through education, advocacy, awareness, um, and different programs that we run. I actually support our university outreach, so I wanted to come up and be here for this, but we have other colleagues that reach out to other Catholic institutions around the country, dioceses, high schools, different networks of Catholic partners to engage them and inspire them in this work um, and make appropriate connections uh, with what CRS is doing in the field. There's also a lot of uh, things like webinars and with different ways to distribute information about, about where the work that we're doing. Great. Um, our technology is working quite well, <laughs> although we'll really find out when we connect with uh, Mariana. That's why I build in a little extra time. I just wanted to, we in the introduction, um, we didn't say some things that needed to be said. Uh, for those of you who are new to CRS, uh, Catholic Relief Service is the official relief and development agency of the U.S. Catholic community. It's been in existence for 70 years and works in 93 countries now, is that right? Uh, serving what? Uh, how many people? Uh, uh, right now, just shy of 100 million. 100 million people, without regard to race, sex, nation, or religion. And it's recognized in the international non governmental community <coughs> as a leader in the use of information and communications technology in building resistance in poor communities. And then last March, as you said, uh, over 400 non governmental agencies uh, sent staff donors, educators, government representatives, and technology providers were present at its uh, sixth annual International Communications and Technology Conference for Development in Nairobi. So this was all part of it, to be part of the introduction, but it didn't happen. So I wanted to make sure it does happen. So I want to thank uh, Steve for his presentation. Thank you, too, for your good questions. And again, there will be time to have a conversation with Steve over lunch. But we're going to break right now for about five minutes because we do want to pull in Mariana Hensley from India, and hopefully the fireworks have subsided. Okay, so please help yourself, and we'll start right away at 1025.